The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to John Clauser, Alain Aspe and Anton Zeilinger, the three scientists who made the most significant contributions to testing Bell's inequality. And this is the story of John Clauser and the first generation of Bell tests in the 1970s. But first I have to give you a short summary of what has happened before. All right, two assumptions about the universe that we hold to be true. First, the principle of locality. Things can interact at most at the speed of light, meaning you cannot influence faraway objects without some time passing first. Second, the principle of realism holds that properties of objects exist whether we observe them or not. In simple words, the moon is there even when you're not looking. Albert Einstein used these two principles, which he held to be self-evidently true, to show that quantum mechanics has holes. It is incomplete, as he put it in his EPR paper from 1935. In other words, there are some hidden variables we just don't know yet, described by a more fundamental theory than quantum mechanics. The whole quantum world only looks this weird and random to us because we don't yet understand these deeper mechanisms, these hidden variables. In the 1960s, John Stuart Bell managed to go one step further than that. He showed that there is a direct contradiction between local and real hidden variables and quantum mechanics. Only one of those things could be true. This is the famous result of the Bell inequality. If you're interested in either Einstein's EPR paradox and hidden variables, or John Bell's inequality that allows us to test whether reality is quantum, you can check out these previous videos. Now, the only thing that remains to be done was a Bell test. To actually perform an experiment testing the Bell inequalities to see which one is correct. Local realism or quantum mechanics. What happened after Bell had published his theorem in 1964? Frankly, not a lot. Most physicists simply didn't know about it and those who did mostly dismissed it. The consensus was simply that there were no open questions anymore. No more need for those fundamental philosophical discussions of the early days. Niels Bohr, one of the founding fathers of quantum theory, had debunked Einstein's silly ideas and more importantly, it has been thoroughly settled in the lab. Quantum mechanics has had a spectacular run of being correct for decades and doubting it had become the equivalent of being a flat earther. But a few people were fascinated by the idea. For example, John Clauser, a young and headstrong, some would even say pig-headed, undergrad at Caltech. Ever since he had read Bell's paper, he was absolutely hooked and he was aching to do the experiment himself. He consulted his professors at Caltech, including Richard Feynman, who told him this was just a waste of time. There was no need for yet more proofs that quantum mechanics is right. And then he kicked Clauser out of his office. Clauser moved on to Columbia in New York for his PhD in astrophysics. But he still couldn't quite shake the idea of doing a Bell test. He kept talking to physicists who had done similar experiments and finally in 1969, he did found one at Berkeley which had used polarization of photons and this would be perfect for doing a Bell test. Simply put, a wave has two directions, one in which it moves and one in which it oscillates. In the case of light, the latter is called polarization. A polarization filter has a direction and will let light of the same direction pass and partially block any light of different direction. The probability for light to pass the filter is proportional to the projection of the light polarization vector on the filter vector. So the more similar the polarization of the light is to the filter, the more likely it is to pass. This also means that light polarized perpendicular to the filter will be completely blocked. But Glauser had to finish his PhD in New York first. Plus, the experimentalists at Berkeley saw no point in his ideas and shut him down. No, no, no! Clauser decided to write to John Bell directly and finally got his affirmation. 
Bell wrote that he didn't know of any experiments having been done so far, and while he did believe that the test would come up in favor of quantum mechanics, there was always the possibility that it would not, which would, as he wrote, shake up the world. And this prospect sealed the deal for Clauser. He would absolutely try to get the experiment done. At about the same time, Abner Shimoni left to teach physics at Boston University, after having studied both philosophy and physics. He had also been intrigued by Bell's paper, and uh, now that he was a professor, he definitely wanted to do an experiment on it. Together with his grad student Michael Horn, he began planning how this could be achieved. The first thing they needed was a source for all those entangled particles that show up in the Bell inequality. Entanglement means that two quantum particles are created in such a way that one or more of the properties would always be exactly the same. And it turns out that a relatively easy way to get such particles is through an atomic cascade. An atomic cascade is a process where an atom is first excited by absorbing light and thus climbing up to a higher energy level. From there, it will eventually fall back to the ground state. When this is done in two steps, this is called an atomic cascade. And it will produce two photons that are entangled, meaning they are produced together and share a number of properties. They move away in opposite directions and always have the exact same polarization. Shimony and Horn weren't able to build such an apparatus themselves, but they did find out that just across town, at Harvard, another grad student called Richard Holt was just setting up an experiment to measure the lifetime of excited states of mercury using atomic cascades. So they paid a visit to Holt and actually convinced him to postpone his original experiment and join their effort instead. Shortly after, Shimoni found out that Clauser was interested in a Bell test as well, so he got him on board too. Clauser only had two weeks time after handing in his PhD thesis until he had to defend it. So he went up to Boston and threw himself into the preparations for a Bell experiment. And after securing this source for entanglement, the next step was to adapt the Bell inequality in such a way that you could use it with actual experimental data. This went on until Clauser graduated and managed to get a postdoc position at Berkeley which he hoped would give him the chance to get his hands on his very own Bell experiment. Being an avid sailor, he went there on his own boat, stopping several times along the way to communicate back and forth with Shimoni. Finally, by the time Klaus arrived in California, the work was completed. The group had come up with their very own variation of Bell's inequality, called CHSH after their initials. Named after Clauser, Horn, Shimony and Holt, the CHSH inequality is a derivative of the Bell inequality. It assumes measuring the polarization direction of two photons at two locations A and B, characterized by the vectors A and B, and then measuring again in different directions A prime and B prime. This is better suited to actual experiments because these are values you can directly measure. And it also allows for imperfect measurements, which are counted as zero. Summing over many measurements gives the expectation value E. For some combinations of polarization directions, the value predicted by quantum mechanics violates this inequality. And these are exactly the cases to be measured in a Bell test. But Clauser was not supposed to do a Bell test at Berkeley. He had in fact been hired by Charles Townes to do radio astronomy. Of course, this is not how Clauser saw it. He had come to Berkeley specifically to commandeer the old apparatus and run a Bell test. But the professor who owned the old experiment was simply not having it. He thought this was a waste of time as Bohr had already debunked any silly ideas about hidden variables. At this point, help arrived from an unexpected quarter. Charles Towns not only allowed Clauser to work part-time on his Bell experiment, he also persuaded his colleagues to let Clauser use their old apparatus. There's a little backstory here. Towns had also been opposed by figureheads of physics when he had been working on his ideas as a young physicist. 
Both Niels Bohr and Jun von Neumann had tried to convince him that his idea could not possibly work and he was just wasting time. Well, his idea happened to actually work. It was called the laser and it won him the Nobel Prize in 1964. With this hurdle out of the way, Klauser recruited the grad students to it Friedman and they went on to convert the old apparatus into their new experiment. These pictures show both of them with their finished apparatus and it shows just how huge that thing was. Let's look at it in more detail. The oven is pretty much just that. An oven that is hot enough to evaporate metal, in this case calcium. This means that calcium atoms are ejected at high speeds and if you create a vacuum around the oven, these can move without colliding with air molecules. In other words, you create an atom beam. These liberated atoms are then bombarded with photons of the correct energy that they can absorb. Subsequently, they go through an atomic cascade to produce the entangled photons we need. This required a very high intensity light to get enough output that can be measured. And the simple solution for this is of course the laser. Unfortunately, at the time of the experiment, lasers had just been invented a couple years ago and they were not yet readily available. Especially for experiments that nobody really wanted to fund. So Clauser and Friedman had to build a lamp. <laughs> a really big, high intensity lamp. The calcium atoms required UV light as input and would then emit a green and a purple photon, which were entangled and would shoot off in opposite directions. After this, they would need to be polarized in the desired direction, but again, the readily available polarizers of the time were not efficient enough and could not be used. So they had to be built from scratch and had to be very big. These huge horns on either side of the machine contained the polarizers. Inside, there are a series of thin plates of glass mounted at an angle, making use of an old, well-known optical effect. When light hits such a glass plate, part of it is reflected and part of it is transmitted. And at a certain angle called Brewster's angle, all of the reflected light is only polarized in one direction. This leaves the transmitted part somewhat polarized in the other direction. And if you repeat this often enough, the light at the end will only be polarized in the desired direction. It's a bit like sieves slowly removing the wrong polarization. These gigantic polarization horns needed to be rotated to allow for measuring different polarization directions and used so-called Geneva gears to achieve that. This meant a horn was rotated, then remained at a certain angle to allow for measurement and would only then be rotated further, etc. You can see the Geneva gear in the photos of the experiment. Finally, the photons need to be measured. This was done by phototubes on the very end of the apparatus, where in theory each photon would trigger a cascade of electrons, which would then form a neat electric signal. So, you throw photons in and get an electric signal out. In reality though, not all photons trigger the signal, while undesired external effects like heat did sometimes trigger a signal. Therefore, the counters had to be heavily cooled and shielded as perfectly as possible. And while all of this was going on, the rest of the original group, primarily Holt, were building their own version of the experiment in Harvard. It was conceptually similar to the Berkeley experiment, but it also differed in many details. Uh, for example, Holt had to use mercury instead of calcium. He used a double refracting calcite crystal as a polarizer. And he had no Geneva gear, uh, etc. And while Friedman saw the Boston group as colleagues to cooperate with, Clauser considered them to be competitors. And he did not want to cooperate. He wanted to win. It took Friedman and Clauser two years of sourcing, building, testing and rebuilding until they were finally ready for measurements. In the end, their experiment ran for 280 hours over two months until all data had been gathered. They published their results in 1972 and got a strong violation of the inequality. The quantum prediction had been verified and local realism was wrong. Friedman derived a more specialized inequality from the CHSH inequality, 
because he was only interested in the maximally possible violation, which would occur at an angle difference of 45 degrees, which gave this inequality. Where the Rs are measured coincidence rates of two photon detection at A and B, while R0 is the base rate without polarizers. This quantity would have to always remain below zero for local realism, while it would be above zero for quantum mechanics. The predicted value for this was while the measured result was in the abbreviated official story the curtain falls at this point and we move happily on to something else in reality this is not what happened and this is actually a great lesson in how science really works at harvard the experiment proved more difficult to work with especially the mercury finally the group did get a result, but this turned out to be the exact opposite, a confirmation of local realistic hidden variables. But they were so unsure about their results that they sat on it for a year and only published in 1974. And obviously this caused a great deal of confusion. I mean, what are you supposed to do with two experiments claiming the exact opposite of each other? In science what we do is we try to reproduce the original experiments and we also try to do similar experiments to check the results. First, Clauser himself repeated the experiment using mercury. He also found it very difficult to work with and it took him more than 400 hours of runtime. But he got another confirmation of quantum mechanics in the end. Secondly, there was a group at Texas A&M who managed to get their hands on one of those brand new fancy lasers. And with a light source this strong, their experiment didn't take hundreds of hours to run, but just 90 minutes. They also confirmed quantum mechanics. As the results started piling up in favor of quantum mechanics, things finally became clear. Local realistic hidden variables no longer had any leg to stand on. Reality was inherently quantum. Now, these first experiments were far from perfect. They certainly had severe technical limitations, especially concerning photon counting. So a number of open loopholes were pointed out. And that's a fair criticism to make, and uh, we will talk more about this in a future video. Nevertheless, these early experiments were a huge achievement. They were the first to show that you could actually test the Bell inequality. But even more important, they showed that quantum entanglement over large distances was a real thing. Up until then, Entanglement had been something deeply quantum, something hidden within atoms or molecules, so at most over distances of nanometers. These experiments demonstrated entanglement over several meters, a billion times more than before. Alright, that's it for today. And uh, next time it gets even crazier when we look at the second generation of tests from the 1980s, especially the ones done by Alain Aspé that got him part of the Nobel Prize in 2022 together with Clauser. So, see you next time and subscribe for more. <laughs>